So, and thank you for those for, for those wonderful opening remarks. So, so obviously we have a clash between the interests of fossil fuel companies and the banks that underwrite them and what we need to do in the face of the climate crisis. We know that we need to cut global emissions in half in a mere 12 years if we are to keep warming levels at any, well, I mean, we can't even talk about safe levels anymore because what we're experiencing now is so far from safe. I mean, as we speak, um, California is on fire. Um, thousands and thousands of people are under evacuation. Some two million people face um, electricity cutoffs. Uh, and, and this is, you know, November this should not be happening. And yet it happened just last year um, in the deadly campfire so-called campfire where um, almost 90 people died in the deadliest uh, wildfire in California's history. And this is just California. Um, this is a global crisis and the truth is that the global north is more protected um, than people in the southern hemisphere who um, are in hotter climates to begin with, drier climates to begin with. And of course this is um, already a major driver of migration, certainly in Central America and so on. So, I'm not going to do Climate 101. Um, what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change told us is that really the best we can do at this point is keep warming um, up below 1.5 degrees Celsius. We've warmed the planet by one degree and we are already seeing this unraveling, right? This is what um, we're seeing with these fires including in the Amazon, which also has to do with willful arson and deforestation, but we're losing major features of the planet. The Amazon, Arctic summer sea ice, the Great Barrier Reef. I mean, these are the major features of planet Earth, and we are breaking them, okay? And that's one degree warming. So what the scientific community has told us is we really should do everything possible to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. But in order to do so, we would have to cut global emissions in half in now 11 years. They told us 12 years, but that was a year ago, and that's the thing about time, right? Um, so that, that, that emission reduction level means winding down existing fossil fuel projects, existing fossil fuel infrastructure. What fossil fuel companies have done is they already have many times more that in their reserves and they're continuing to explore for new fossil fuels. So continuing to push for um, an extension of the fossil fuel frontier. And that's because like any corporation, they are built on a model where they have to continue to grow and grow and they have to, to reassure their shareholders that they always have more in reserve as they have in production. So you just have this straight up clash between what we need to do to have a habitable planet um, and what they need to do in order to stay in business. They need to grow and we need that fossil fuel frontier to contract. But I think the clash between our economic model and, uh, I think the clash between our economic model and the climate crisis runs deeper than just one sector, even though it is a sector that is underwritten by hedge funds, underwritten by banks, um, underwritten by the insurance company. And so, so when, even when you look at the direct fossil fuel sector, it encompasses really the, the most powerful corporations um, on the planet. You know, companies like Chase, BlackRock, and so on. But, but even without that, and this is what I've been writing about now for a long time, is that if we want to understand really why we have failed to do what is necessary in the face of this crisis that our leaders have known about and been warned about now for many decades, um, a lot of it has to do with the, the, the free market orthodoxy that has governed all of this time, that has said we, need to, we can only have solutions that come from the market, um, we have had this case of epic bad timing where we've been trying to solve a, a collective crisis that requires huge investments in the public sphere, that requires corporate regulation, which requires entertaining notions like some industries are just too dangerous and we actually have to take control over them and wind them down because 
they will not do it themselves because it isn't actually against their fiduciary duty to do it. Um, but we have this clash, and yet the very decades that we needed to to do this are the decades of Thatcherism and Reaganism and deregulation and privatization and low taxes and public austerity. Um, and so, of course, we haven't dealt with it. So you have an obvious clash with the fossil fuel sector and the financial sector. You also have an obvious clash with neoliberalism, okay, privatization and regulation. But it's, it's actually deeper than that still, which is that we have kicked the can down the road so far that now the kind of emission reductions that we need to pull off are completely incompatible with the sort of fundamental uh, imperative of capitalism, which is grow or die, right? Um, and, and which is just measures progress through GDP growth and, and, and consumption growth. And that is not compatible with the kind of emission reduction that we now need to pull off. So you could make an argument that if we listened to scientists in 1988, we could have chipped away at this in a gradual way, and maybe it might have been in some way compatible with you know, a sort of a Keynesian um, a, a form of capitalism. But not after you kick the can down the road for 40 years and, and, and landed us where we are now, which is a world on fire and an incredibly tight and unyielding deadline. Um, that's going to require a far more managed economy. It's going to require some serious contraction in those areas that are all about extraction and consumption. And as you read, you know, from the introduction of my book, we need to say, okay, look, we can have abundance in these areas that all the research shows actually increase well-being, so let's invest in those areas that are actually already low carbon. It doesn't burn a lot of carbon to, to teach kids to care for each other, to make art, to make sure everybody has access to nature, so let's have you know, what's increasingly being called public luxury, because, and, and let's make sure that we do this in a way that is fair, right? So fair on both ends. The people who, you know, as Kendra was talking about, have already been poisoned. Um, their, their school poisoned, their bodies poisoned, under this extractive system, their lands poisoned, under this extractive system, need to benefit the most from the transition. That's a core principle of economic justice. But the other side of that is that the people who did the most, the polluters, have to pay the most, right? Um, and have to pay the steepest price, including losing their assets um, when necessary. So that's, you know, th th that's the clash we're in. It's a pretty big challenge to have that. <laughs> right, so then what I'm hearing is we need to center people who are marginalized, build different approaches that are more seeped in sort of conscious ideology, build electoral strategies uh, and all do this in 11 years to avoid catastrophe. Uh, do you think we can do it in time? We don't have a choice. We actually don't have a choice. The politics and the science dictate that we must. What's the accelerant to make us do it in time? Well, I mean, the, the urgency, this is the urgency, the logic of the science and the, and the politics, I think. And then, I mean, look at what's happened. For massive direct action, which is what yeah, I mean, look what's happening in, in, from Chile to Haiti, you know. So I, this is why I believe, as, a, as somebody who runs a political party, if we're not committed to direct action, and if we're not, you know, like, we can't be seduced by the logic of neoliberalism or the safety of of, of liberals, right? We're concerned with things like decorum, uh, things like. Or somebody said we have to break every rule of the market playbook. Yeah, I mean we have to break every rule of the market playbook, and we have to actually break laws that are on other are. other books. If we want, if we want any change, <laughs> if we want any, so we, if you think about it, like laws are political. Right? Like you go on state legislatures, they write the laws. I already said that we, we have a corporately captured government. So these laws are designed in order to, to make it very hard for us to do the type of organizing that we have to do. And so it, um, the tactics have to be, we have to challenge the concept of legality, of decorum, of, of 
you know, there's, there's this whole idea that, that Trump's greatest crime is the fact that he's breaking the quorum. That is not his greatest crime, you know? I think it ranks somewhere below gate of children. Yeah. <laughs> so if, we, if we're seduced by liberals that, that our problem is Trump, and his greatest crime, the crime is that he's put a stain on, on the sanctity of the, of the presidency, then we're doomed. <laughs> right? And so we have to fundamentally sort of challenge all these things if we want any chance in terms of like our, our imaginations and what and tactically what we're willing to do. Naomi, you are Charles Gray. You are uh, as great a believer in democracy and the same kind where voting is necessary but not sufficient. What is your you lay out some of your vision for what you see in a kind of not revitalization, but actually kind of creation of new democratic practices. How do you think we get there? What's your vision? How did you come to it? Um, well, I think that the Green New Deal itself is a exciting democ democratizing tool. Because, you know, when we talk about this thing of a Green New Deal, and I think it's invoked and thrown around now willy-nilly, well, the truth is it, it is a, um, the barest sketch, really, uh, of, the, of the transformation that we need. And in the, and, and rightly so, because we don't want this to be handed down from on a high and told, like, here's your new economy, and, you know, just sign on the dotted line. We actually want to craft this. And, and so, you know, I think, and this, I think the Working Families Party is stepping into this space, um, and we need more of that precisely because we have so few institutions that are not siloed on issues. Like we don't have very many spaces that are stable, right? That are not actually just sort of um, kind of political pop-ups around, you know, a moment to campaign or something like that, but actually are sturdy and allow people to come together across issues um, to put forward an agenda, right? Um, so, you know, if you think about what happened with the Green New Deal, uh, it, and it's to your question of can we do this in time, I do believe that we are already in it. I think we are in a very fast-moving political moment. I think we are already changing um, for better and worse. <laughs> uh, you know, when I, when I talk about the fires of our political moment, I talk about three fires. The climate fires, the fires of hate, and our fires, right? And our fires, I think we know those other two fires, we basically know what we're talking about, but the fires of hate are global as well. It is not just Trump, it is Modi, it is Duterte, it is Matteo Salvini, you know, it is Marine Le Pen, it is, you know, it is often country after country these far-right political figures are coming to power using a similar playbook of here's my sharply defined in-group, the superior people in this country, here are the sharply defined out-groups, right? It is white supremacy in this country and in Europe and in Australia, but for Modi it's Hindu supremacy, you know, for Netanyahu it's Jewish supremacy. These are supremacist logics that allow for the barbarism that is a necessary byproduct of their economic policies of continued pillage, right? So we need a rationale, the same way that we needed scientific racism to rationalize the slave trade and colonial land theft, you need a resurgence of this ranking of human life in order to rationalize allowing tens of thousands of people to drown in the Mediterranean, um, you know, to, for families, as you said, to be ripped apart, for kids to be ripped apart from their parents. But also, you know, what is what Modi is doing in Kashmir? Like it is, it is a global moment. Now there is another global moment, and what and what Marie said, and what is happening in Chile? What is happening in Haiti? What happens what is happening in Ecuador, Bolivia? Um, it's complicated, right? Because there are there are left parties involved who have betrayed their bases. Um, but you know, I think just as we need to get out of our certain issue silos in our own national context, I also think we have to be less, we have to get out of our nationalist silos, right? And sort of feel the fire of what is happening in Chile, right? This being the first laboratory of neoliberalism, right? Where the Chicago boys 
could not get their policies introduced under Nixon in the 1970s because Nixon introduced wage and price control and Milton Friedman said that he was the most socialist president we have ever had. And basically they threw them Chile as a bone. They said, go play with Chile. Put your guys in charge. And that's what they did. Um, you know, in 1973, you know, the morning after the coup and Allende's death, on the, that, the next morning there was this thing they called the brick on the desks of all of the, the military men. And it was their neoliberal playbook that was implemented in Chile in pure form. And this is what they are rebelling against now when they say it's not about 30 pesos, the increase in their public transit, it's about 30 years. The fact that after Pinochet's dictatorship ended, the model, the model of neoliberal capitalism, privatization, and the rest of it, never, that was locked in and never changed, no matter which democratic government came into play. Now, one of the things I studied when I wrote the shock doctrine was, was you know, the role of foundations in putting people inside us. The Chicago Boy Program at the University of Chicago, which brought hundreds of Latin American students from Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, but most of all Chile, to go study under Milton Friedman et al. and be indoctrinated in this ideology and then impose it under blood and fire in Latin America, was funded originally by the State Department, but then they handed it over to the Ford Foundation. The Ford Foundation funded the whole damn thing, okay? And then the Ford Foundation funded the human rights activists who cleaned up afterwards. <laughs> And they said, we're not human rights activists, we're socialists. But no, they were rebranded as human rights activists, and the ideology was stripped out of the whole thing. Okay? So this didn't happen by happenstance. It was actually a depoliticization program and a professionalization program where the symptoms of the system that were imposed were, uh, you, know, you were allowed to deal with the symptoms, but you weren't allowed to talk about what that torture served, what those human rights abuses served, and how you can't pry apart the human rights abuses under the Pinochet dictatorship and the economic model that was imposed under that program. They could never have imposed that program without the torture, right? So the fact that, that Chile is in the street in this moment is something we should all feel that, we should all feel that energy as part of a global movement, right? We should feel that, it should, it should, it should make us feel like powerful as well. When, when Puerto Rico stand up, uh, you know, to their governor, they should also, we, we should feel that too. Uh, so we are in a moment where, you know, I think, that things could change very, very quickly. Um, no one was talking about a Green New Deal a year ago, right? And now we have a majority of the Democratic candidates saying they support it. So things are changing very quickly. Like I said, the worse is better, right? Um, but we don't know what we can accomplish in a, in a, in a moment. This, like, it's a tinderbox. It's a literal tinderbox. <laughs> and it can go, it's going to go up in one way or the other. It's the so one thing we know that it's not stable in any way. One, thank you. One, one bizarre contrast in American political history is that Nixon ended hunger and Clinton ended welfare. Uh, true fact. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'm going to stay with you for a minute, but before I want to ask how many people have seen a video called A Message from the Future? Yeah. Where's Ami? Um, Oh, Sam and I wrote the narrative for that video for those of you who are not The star loved it as much as I did. I want to switch to the power of narrative for everyone because it's true, we don't know when change is going to happen, but we know it never happens by accident. And there's a lot of pieces that you mentioned, many of them, that we put into place. But I want to talk about the role of political imagination. And in particular, political imagination about a different future. Uh, that video is an exercise that I landed very powerfully with people. And I've read scholars of fascism talk about how fascists try to extinguish our sense of time, making time a loop, a eternal battle between an us and a them, so that Perhaps this exercise of political imagination about the future is a way to disrupt 
the fascist narrative. So I just want to hear about your experience, whether you're connected to that video. Um, why do you think it landed so powerfully? And then I'm going to ask you about that as well. Um, sure. Um, yeah, so that video came out of a conversation that Avi and I had with um, some of the folks from the Sunrise Movement. Um, and it was the beginning of the kind of pushback against the Green New Deal, but it was early days. I remember we were on the phone with Arshay and Will, and, and they were like, and the backlash actually hasn't even started yet, you know? And we knew, like, look, look this whole half century neoliberal campaign has been a war against the original New Deal. So obviously they're not going to like a Green New Deal because this is the war they've been waging is to dismantle those inadequate, uh, um, that in, those inadequate victories won in the 30s. So, um, so we were thinking about, about messaging and, and needing some, some, some video work, needing, needing um, an other the filmmaker and we're, so, but, but we were also thinking about the role of art in the original New Deal. And, and one of the things when I look at that period, I mean, there are so many, there are so many very legitimate critiques of the original New Deal. Um, but it is worth remembering that, 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 the, that the arts programs under the New Deal were some of the most diverse. Um, it was some of the most significant funding for African American artists in you know, U.S. history, also indigenous <laughs> artists, women artists. Um, it was a bright spot. And it also was a way for the New Deal to do its own messaging, despite the fact that it was under constant attack, not just from the right, but also from the sort of serious center. You know, the New York Times was always saying, it's too much, it's too fast, slow it down, let's study it, why, you know. And so, um, and so I had a conversation that, after that, I called my crab apple, um, and she said that she wanted to do uh, a video where she does these beautiful hand drawings with Alexandria Castro Cortez. We had just run a story in The Intercept, written by Kate Aronoff, about the Green New Deal that was set in the future. And it just told a simple story of somebody who had gone through the Green New Deal and benefited from it, you know, or a child of the Green New Deal, told from their perspective looking back. And it had really resonated very strongly. I think because of what you're talking about, which is just how really rare it is to imagine a future that isn't just us, only worse. Right? Just for, you know, with a little bit of like cannibalism on the side, you know? Um, and, and, and I think we have like this kind of dy dystopia, Wi-Fi fatigue. Um, and, and so we decided to do something similar. And then Abby wrote the script and AOC rewrote it. And then, and, and then it, yeah, nothing any of us has ever done resonated as much as that video. 10 million views in a little bit more than a week. And, and teachers immediately showing it to their students. That was the other thing. We heard from so many educators saying, I showed it to my class the next day, my students are hungry for this. Because so many young people are just actually binging on just scary, scary, scary science. And the idea that there might be an outcome and that you could see it, that where, I mean, you know, in that video, it's not that nothing bad happens. I mean, we talked about Miami going underwater, we talked about the fact that, that you know, there are more shocks to come, but when we build a more humane society, when we invest in the caring professions, and when we, and when, when we have that shift in values, then how we treat each other when those shocks come is really what matters and really what saves lives. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, I think, you know, we're talking about the Green New Deal as an organizing, tool, I mean, I think every sector in every neighborhood should be imagining what the Green New Deal looks like in, like, what, what, is, what does the Green New Deal look like in Philadelphia schools? What do what, what Philly schools look like in 10 years from now, once we've won, right? What is the beautiful, beautiful picture that can be drawn by educators and students and parents together and have a visioning process that is exciting because 
people don't get asked this question, right? Because so many people are just in those daily battles, and like, let's get lead out of the paint, you know? Um, like, let's maybe get an air conditioner in here to deal with the fact that there, you know, these schools weren't built for this kind of heat. Not, how can it be beautiful? How can it be solar powered and put the classroom half the size and recognizing that we can have twice as many teachers because teaching isn't a high carbon profession and rooftop gardens and solar panels and electric school buses and, it gets, and, 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 and food in the cafeteria that's grown by local farmers through agroecology. It's exciting to actually dream this, right? And so, I, you know, if we if we can find a way to just invest in enough um, sectors of communities having that visioning space, I think we would be we would be in such a different political space because we would have the no, but we which we have to fight against. There's a lot to fight against, but we have that sort of beacon that we're that we're that we're reaching towards. And I think that that's why the video the video. Uh, resonating so much is that we just don't get a lot of beacons like that, you know. So I'm going to turn over to you to respond to the, this power of dreaming. Um, I have like 72 more questions, but this is going to have to be the last one because we are out of time and we have some wonderful people we want to hear from next, but sure. give um, us your time. And I was one of those like 10 million people <laughs> and I was really inspired. I remember when I got the, it's like multiple people like, did you see this? Um, so, and I think one of the things in, in your questions, one of the things that you're exposing to me are also just gaps in our capacity, gaps in the capacity of our movement. And I look at nihilism and cynicism as political projects of the, of the right, right? They only succeed if we have a, if as a culture, um, we abide by nihilism and cynicism, and if we allow as a movement, as a progressive and a movement, if we uh, tolerate nihilism and cynicism. And so we have to have, we have to, we have to believe that our politics are popular and that we could win, right? And I've been in a lot of spaces where I felt like, I'm not sure if we, we actually believe we could win or if our politics are popular. And that actually is a byproduct of, of just sort of unchecked, right? right wing and neoliberal sort of nihilism and cynicism, right? And I think, you know, there is a eco-nihilism where, where it's like, okay, um, you're right, climate change is gonna happen, this is what we do about it. I'm gonna save up for my bunker in Zurich or Mars exploration or whatever else, right? And in order to challenge that, we need to invest in culture. Um, we need to invest in storytelling. You know, these, and I think it comes back to, you know, you talked about the Ford Foundation and the, the, you know, the thoughtful sort of prying away of ideology and politics um, from those movements. Um, for far too long in our movements, aesthetics and culture and, uh, you know, uh, actually having an appetite to, to have a radical imagination, those were often seen as side dishes, aesthetics, culture, ideology, and we had to deal with the, the hard skills of knocking on doors and, you know, uh, the, the methodical organizing and getting your rap right, right? And that wasn't by chance that people made those choices to deprioritize those things. And like as a result, we have a tactical movement with no vision. To what end? To what end? And it's far too many of us to actually articulate that. The to what end question, that's the dreamy question. We have to create the spaciousness for us to dream together. And that's the space that culture inhabits. And so we have to actually invest in culture. And oftentimes it's like the afterthought. It's like, oh, let's like, I'm going to get my boy who runs to, to do this um, as a sound, <laughs> you know, to open up our meeting or something like that. I think also just the culture of professionalization that comes from the sort of nonprofit structure, um, it, it is one of the reasons why aesthetics, culture, beauty, dreaming are not woven into the culture of many left movements. In, in, uh, in the U.S., 
right? And we have to challenge that if we want to win. I think it's like a, a, a prime directive that we invest in culture um, because that is the delivery system for our ideology, right? Um, ideological formation doesn't just happen through study groups, right? That video did more for the ideological formation of those 10 million people than if, uh, you know, the best think, think piece. You know, we're like tweeting around think pieces. You know, that, that is meaningful, and the word is meaningful, but, you know, people both understand and learn through different modes. And the fact that we're just cutting off one of our arms by not investing in culture, I think, is a crime. And again, we'll lose. So, so it, it needs to be seen as a, as a very serious wing of our movement. We need to invest in the storytelling. And the last thing I'll say is that I was talking to some comrades from the, from the movement for Black Lives. I think like this is where this is where you know Afrofuturism I think is like really exciting as a plane for discovering our most radical imaginations. And they're, they're like they're coming, they're trying to develop what a red, black, and green New Deal might look like. And I was like, yes, that's we need to figure out what that might look like. Um, and to me, that yeah, white papers are important on some level, right? But you know, we have to make an intervention at the level of, of ideation because, you know, outside of our bodies and our organizations, there's so many limiting factors, the amount of money we have, the race, class, and gender dynamics, all those things. But inside of our organizations and, and our bodies and our minds, the only thing that limits us is our ability to dream. And culture ignites that. <laughs>